Well, good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Glad to have you here. Uh, some of you may be here for uh, the final session, one of the final sessions for the Alpha Omega Conference. And uh, we are glad that you are here with us. If you would, bear with me a minute as I give some announcements for our own people, uh, or if they apply to you and something sounds interesting, you're more than welcome as well. But just a reminder that next Sunday, uh, Resurrection Sunday, we'll be having our Easter breakfast at 8.30, and that will begin from at 8.30. So come, plan on being here. Uh, Dara will do a great job with, along with all of her helpers, as she always does, and look forward to that time of fellowship together. We will not have adult Sunday school next week. We'll start breakfast at 8.30. It'll go to about 10. Choir will be uh, uh, warming up for the morning service, and uh, so we're not going to be having adult Sunday school. Kids Sunday school will still be happening, and so just be aware of that. Um, come, have breakfast, and then uh, enjoy the fellowship together as we then look forward to celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ together next Sunday morning. Also want to let you know, remind you men, that coming up very quickly is our men's retreat. Um, if you have not grabbed one of these or filled it out or gone online and registered, please do so. I know that's coming up quickly and maybe you're planning on coming, but uh, you haven't, or maybe you just told us by word of mouth, we tend to forget, especially what you tell us on Sundays, there's so many other things going on. So please go online, uh, fill it out. If you have questions, maybe you can only be there for part of the week, uh, talk to Pastor Benjamin and he'd be happy to work through that with you. Uh, we're excited to have Dr. Pat Odell with us from Baptist Mid-Missions. He's the president now of Baptist Mid-Missions and has been the last couple of years, and he will be speaking at our men's retreat, and then that following Sunday, the 23rd, he will be here, and he will be doing uh, both Sunday school and the morning service on the 23rd. That way, all of you will get to meet him. Uh, neat guy, uh, loves the Lord. He was a, a youth uh, instructor, youth pastor, professor at Faith Baptist Bible College, and then was the senior pastor at, uh, in Elyria, Ohio, uh, very well-known great uh, GRBC church there, uh, before he took over as the president of Baptist Mid-Missions. So that's coming up. Please, men, uh, if you can come even for the evenings um, or for part or the whole thing, we would love to have you there, but please let us know that you are coming. Also, on the 30th of this month, we'll be having an all-church barbecue and uh, we're looking forward to that time together. And that morning, uh, we will do our morning service during the Sunday school hour. So we'll have start our morning service at 9.30, and then we will get those barbecues going. And uh, we will start, uh, bring, it'll be bring your own meat. And we, if you don't have a, we'll have a bunch of grills. And uh, you can cook it yourself or have one of us cook it for you. And uh, we will look forward to that. We'll have a sign-up sheet in the next, uh, next week so that we can start uh, letting you know what you can bring other than uh, your choice of meat and look forward to that time together. And uh, uh, hopefully the weather will be nice, maybe a little bit warmer than it has been, and pray for no rain that day. We still could use some more rain, but not that day. So uh, looking forward to that time together. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that we uh, have had uh, several that have asked about a baptismal service. And so uh, month of April is crazy, but we will be doing that sometime in May. So if you have not been baptized and would like to, please come see me and would love to chat with you about that and make arrangements for that. It's always a wonderful time together uh, when we get to celebrate uh, uh, in baptism what the Lord is doing in individuals' lives. Also wanted to remind you one last thing, I remind you about our nominating committee. Uh, we, it's that time of year where we need to take nominations for uh, officers and for elders here at Grace Baptist Church, and uh, there's a list on the back of those who are on the nominating committee, but if you have names that you would like to recommend for elder, please see one of them. Uh, it's Andy Paradis, Jonathan Skillman, uh, Roger Page, Pastor Benjamin, and myself. You could talk to any one of us and submit names, and then the nominating committee will go through those names and make sure that they're consistent with the requirements, biblical requirements, and that people even are willing to serve. And uh, we will get those names posted for you a couple uh, Sundays before our annual meeting. And uh, so please uh, take note of that. And it's an important part of your uh, way of serving as members here at Grace Baptist Church and of preserving uh, the future of the church as we serve together. Um, those are the announcements I have. Let me open with a word of prayer. 
and then Pastor Benjamin will come as we, and lead us in singing this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and thank you that we can come together this morning and we can do so freely as opposed to many around the world who have already met today. Lord, things that we take for granted, may we not do so. May we appreciate the freedoms that you give us. But Lord, may we in even a greater extent appreciate the truth of your word that brings us together. Lord, I pray that as we come together today and as brothers and sisters in Christ meet across our community today to hear your word, that Lord, you would use the proclamation of your word mightily in the minds and hearts of your people. Pray also as well that as the word goes out that maybe unbelievers who are present in these services might hear the truth and they might uh, respond to that truth in faith. Lord, we, may we not again take for granted what you have given us in Christ, what you have given us by giving us your word, absolute truth in the midst of the chaos and uncertainty around us. May we cling to that truth. May we not deviate from that truth. May we allow your truth to be authoritative over our lives, continually submitting ourselves to it as we study it and as we implement it in our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we be characterized as men and women of the word, unashamedly standing upon it, even when it is ridiculed and scorned by those around us. Lord, may your word, may your spirit be what directs each step of our lives. May we submit ourselves to you, realizing that we cannot in our own power and our own strength follow what you have asked us to follow in your word, but that yet you have provided for us everything we need through the Holy Spirit, through your word, through Christ in us. Lord, as we go out from here even today, may our hearts be encouraged through your word. Lord, even as we look at the world around us, even with so many unknowns in regards to the immediate future, Lord, you have given us so much to cling to, to find hope in, and not just a wish or a desire according to this world, but that which is sure and steadfast, an anchor of the soul. May we treat your word and your promises in that manner. May it be what gives us uh, steadfastness, which allows us to stand firm in the midst of the shifting sands of this world, even as we long for and look for your return. And so, Lord, even as we close in prayer right now and continue our services, we say Maranatha. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. Isn't it good to be together on the first day of the week? You know, on this day, each Sunday, we celebrate what? Christ's resurrection. You know, next Sunday, we we spend special focus and time and emphases on that, on his resurrection. But today, I want to draw our attention a little bit to the fact that Christ died for sins. These are two halves, two central pieces of the good news of the gospel. But even before Christ's death... There was a time when he came into Jerusalem, and some recognized him as king. I want to read you this passage from John chapter 12 as we get started here. John 12, beginning in verse 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and they had, then that they had done these things to him. You know, Christ is king and always has been king. He's not reigning from his kingdom, his throne yet, but we celebrate who he is. And just now I invite you to stand. This first song, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, looks back to the passage that we just read. Let's sing it together, number 108.
not a song we sing every day, is it? Some good truths. I invite you to turn over to At the Cross, or Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed, 129, as we continue to ponder Christ's death. We'll get to the resurrection next Sunday, but let's not minimize his death for our sins, right? passage. It should be on the screen for us here out of Mark chapter 15. We just sang of the cross, right? And uh, let's be reminded of what they did to Christ. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. Again, we, we thrill to the resurrection, um, and yet it's Christ's death as the one who died for us with the resurrection that purchased our salvation. This next song then um, sort of turns our gaze back to the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, let's sing it together.
Father, we do pause even at the solemnity of Christ's death on the cross. And these are truths that uh, we know and um, certainly we're well acquainted with. Christ died. He died on the cross. He died for my sins. And yet may we not forget that it was your great love. It was your plan. It was your mercy, your extension of redemption for us and on behalf of the whole world that Christ went to the cross. He willingly went to the cross out of that. And so, Father, we, we praise you, the triune God, for your work of uh, the atonement, of securing all that is necessary for us to be forgiven of our sins. May we not take that for lightly. May, may we not take that lightly. May it continue, even this day, to encourage and challenge our hearts. Lord, the lives we live now in this broken world. Uh, Christ knows something of that, for he lived and walked in a sin-cursed world, filled with the joys, filled with the sorrows. And so, Father, I pray for each of us as a church family, today and through the week ahead, that we might live well-pleasing to you, we might walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Father, continue to strengthen and encourage us, even in our service, together now in Christ's name I pray amen please stand with me if you would for our next song this song uh, one that isn't in your hymn book one we've sang before is called power of the cross let's sing it together
wonderful truths there. Oh, the power of the cross. Aren't we thankful? I introduce you to this next song. This will be our song of the month. Come people of the risen king. And this song is a call to all believers to rejoice. My mind thinks of Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Why? The Lord is near. He's so near. He is with us. We should always be able to rejoice. Let's try it together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, it says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. We get to celebrate that next week. But it goes on and says, the first fruits of those who are asleep, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Charles Ryrie said that Christ must 
be exalted in the same arena in which he was seemingly defeated. That's what this passage says when it says he must reign. All authority must be subjected to him. Well, 1 John tells us that Satan is still actively running about this world, creating a havoc, and still is given a semblance of power. And there will come a time when Christ will defeat Satan, when he will rule upon the earth, when all things will be subjected to him, and he will be declared victorious to the glory of God the Father, that he might be all and in all. That is absolutely something we believe and hold to, starting in Genesis chapter 1 when he declared that man would have dominion and certainly man fell. But the second Adam, we are told, comes and he will one day reign. And what a glorious truth that is. We sing today all these songs about Christ is king and certainly he is ruler over all things. But he will one day come and he will sit upon the throne of David and he will be king of kings as he rules upon the throne that was promised and all things will be placed in subjection under his feet. You know, we look at all the things going on around us and the chaos. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to having a front row seat in a glorified body to that taking place. And so Dr. Ice is going to come and share with us a little bit more about this topic of premillennialism. Dr. Ice, why don't you come? Before that, I was inspired by the fact that today is uh, Palm Sunday, and we see in Luke 19, 41 and following, it says, and when he approached, Jesus is the he, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and will surround you and hem me in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And so this was a week, uh, on this same day almost 2,000 years ago, and so that's what we look forward to next week after he is crucified and resurrected. And as the pastor was talking about before I got up here, we're going to be talking about the importance of premillennialism, when the, he will return and reign in Jerusalem for a 1,000 years. So premillennialism is the view that says you have the tribulation in Revelation, that's chapters 4 through 19, and then Jesus returns at the end, and then you have the millennium following. Six times it says uh, that he is going to reign for a thousand years in chapter 20. It's very simple. This is the view of the early church. This is a view I think clearly Scripture teaches. And then at the end of that, you have the great wide throne judgment and the end of history, and we go into the new heavens and new earth, which I believe is going to be a brand new creation for all eternity. Now, there are different views of this. There's amillennialism. Can anybody, everybody say ah? That means no millennium. Amillennialism teaches that the current church age is the millennium. Can you believe that? Well, I don't. Uh, and therefore, Christ comes at the end of history. It's a very boring view compared to premillennialism. He just kind of returns, and then we go into eternity. And this is a view that, uh, as we'll see later, has developed in around the 400s and has the view of Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy, and most Protestant denominations in the United States today. Well, and a very similar view, but a little different, is called post-millennialism. And it holds a similar view uh, that amillennialism does, that Christ comes at the end of history and then we go into eternity. But it believes they will, that the church will produce continual progress and the majority of the world, some have even taught every person will become a believer before Christ returns. 
That's hard to swallow, but it's even hard to put in your mouth, let alone swallow, uh, because, well, it doesn't happen. And of course, what did they say about what's going on now in the world? Well, they say we could be in the early stages of the church after 2,000 years here. You know, well, uh, I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense either. So we're coming to you from a premillennial perspective here that simply taken Christ returns and then we go into the thousand year reign of Christ with him ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. So I've got various reasons for the support of premillennialism. First is consistent literal interpretation. Next is unconditional nature of the covenants. Next is the Abrahamic covenant. Then the Old Testament teaches literal earthly kingdom. Uh, the kingdom carried, is carried unchanged from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Christ supports an earthly kingdom. Uh, multiple resurrections in Scripture. Revelation 20 teaches premillennialism, as I've just noted. And the early church was premillennial. And the failure of amillennialism and postmillennialism. And premillennialism harmonizes the entire Bible. So let's look at these different issues, consistent literal interpretation. And what we mean by that is uh, there's two uses of the word literal when it comes to hermeneutics. Uh, it, one refers to your system of interpretation, and the other use is whether a particular word or phrase is literal or figurative. They call that denotative or connotative. So we're talking about the interpretive system use of that. And uh, so we see uh, an amillennialist, postmillennialist, Oswald Alice from about a, 75 years ago said, literal interpretation has always been a marked feature of premillennialism in dispensationalism, and that is the brand of premillennialism that we hold to. It has been carried to an ex extreme. Uh, we would say it's applied consistently. We have seen that this literalism found its most thoroughgoing expression in the claim that Israel means Israel. Weird. And that the church was a mystery unknown to the prophets and first made known to the apostle Paul. He goes on and says, Now if the principle of interpretation is adopted that Israel always means Israel, that it does not mean the church, then it follows a necessity that practically all of our information regarding the millennium will concern a Jewish or Israelite age, and that's correct. And uh, so he sees and understands that if Israel means Israel, which it does, uh, then premillennialism makes sense. Then we see the unconditional nature of the covenants. There are eight basic covenants spoken of in the Bible, and almost all of them are what we call unconditional covenants. And uh, God declares the end of what each of these covenant is going to achieve, but the means that he uses to fulfill unconditional covenants is often uh, tied in with conditional covenants, so it becomes a little complicated here. In other words, he gives the Abrahamic covenant that this is going to happen, certain things are going to happen, but then he comes in with the conditional covenant of the Mosaic Law as the means through which this is going to happen. And one of those means, for example, is that Israel has to believe that Jesus is Messiah. And, of course, we've been through uh, the, the 69 weeks of Daniel, and it's paused because Israel has not yet accepted the Messiah, but that's what the tribulation is all about. It's going to lead to that, and then those conditions are going to be fulfilled, and he will then fulfill uh, all of the conditions of the unconditional covenant, like the Abrahamic covenant. So then we see that the Abrahamic covenant is the mother of all covenants. And it's given in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. By the way, it's repeated 19 more times in the book of Genesis alone. It's repeated 63 times in the book of Deuteronomy. So you think he's trying to make a point? Yes, he is. But we see sub-covenants that cover the three basic elements of the Abrahamic covenant, the land, the seed, and the blessing aspects of the covenant. And we see the 
land of Israel covenant in Deuteronomy 30 that expands upon the land promises for the nation of Israel, which have not yet been fulfilled. We see the Davidic covenant uh, that expands upon the seed, and it, this is the one that predicts that Christ, the Messiah, will be the means through which that aspect of the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled. And the blessing is the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, which was initiated at Christ's first coming, but it will be fulfilled during the millennium. And so he has these covenants, uh, <clears throat> and we know that in Genesis 15, when he cut the covenant, he put Abraham to sleep. So it's a one-sided covenant. It's all left up to God. God's the one that's going to fulfill these. So we see the Old Testament teaches a literal earthly kingdom. And the kingdom will be on earth, not in heaven, which is what the ah mills and post mills teach. Uh, and we see in Isaiah 11, 9, it says, They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is going to be an earthly kingdom. And uh, how do the waters cover the sea? Totally. And he goes on and says in Psalm 2, verse 8, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as thine inheritance. He's talking about the Messiah here. And the very ends of the earth is thy possessions. He says, Israel shall be reestablished in her own lands. We see in Amos 9, 15, I will also plant them, Israel, on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. And that will be accomplished by the time of the second coming. Israel's back in the land today. And uh, I don't know about you, but I remember uh, when it happened. Um, I, my wife and I have recently celebrated our 50th anniversary. We went to Israel on our honeymoon in uh, January. We got married in December of 72 and went to Israel in January of 73. And... We thought by now, you know, we wanted to make sure we got married before the rapture occurred. Well, we accomplished that. And we thought it would have happened by now, but, you know, a little off on those kind of things. But we uh, are looking forward to Christ's coming and uh, the fact that he's going to establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years and then forever in, on into eternity. So the kingdom shall extend to the whole earth, whole earth and will include believing Gentiles. That's most of us here today. And we see in Isaiah 49, 6, it says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. We also see that Christ shall reign as king over all the earth in Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one in his name, the only one. Well, we're certainly not in that time, are we? <laughs> and then we see next, the kingdom carries unchanged into the New Testament. In other words, what it's taught in the Old Testament is carried unchanged into the New Testament. There's not a spiritual kingdom, for example, that uh, develops in the New Testament. So the kingdom hope of the prophets is carried over unchanged in the New Testament. We see in Matthew 2, 2 it says, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? That's who the wise men were looking for. John Walford, uh, president of Dallas Seminary, one of my professors that I had back in the late 70s, says, Whenever the precise kingdom promise of the Old Testament are introduced, these promises and their literal fulfillment are never denied, corrected, or altered, but are instead confirmed. And that's exactly right. And we see in Luke 1, 30 through 33, where it says, The angel said to her, <clears throat> Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall... <coughs> Uh, name him Jesus, which is Joshua in the Old Testament, Yeshua. Uh, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Forever is a long time. So that hasn't happened yet, has it? And then we see in Acts 1, 6 through 7, right before Jesus ascends from the Mount of Olives, and so when they had come together, they were asking him, and this is what's called an imperfect tense in the original language, meaning they're repeatedly asking him over and over again, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, why would they do that? Well, it says that he had been teaching them for 40 days about the kingdom of God. So you can see why they thought at this point in history that the kingdom was going to come. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So these are fixed from the sovereign plan or decree of God already. And uh, we're not there yet. And then we see in Acts 3, later Peter preaches that famous sermon. And he says, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, well, every prophet except Jonah talks about a future kingdom. Not to mention the Psalms and books like Deuteronomy. Do you know 28% of Deuteronomy is prophetic? Yes, it is. It gives an outline of Israel's history in Deuteronomy 4 and chapter 30 and 31. Uh, that his Christ or his Messiah should suffer that he has, uh, uh, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing. So here's a, a phrase that refers to the millennium. May come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. That's always been the goal uh, for earth's history is the kingdom of God. But it ain't here yet. And so we also see that Christ supports the idea of an earthly kingdom. And we see premillennialism supported by the personal testimony of Christ. In Zechariah 14.9 it says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one, his name the only one. And so we see Jesus saying in Matthew 19, uh, he said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, so that's a term for the kingdom. And by the way, that word's only used here and, and in Titus 2.13 for personal regeneration. So he views uh, a future time of history as a time of regeneration as well. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, and you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left homes, houses, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or children, or forms for my name's sake, shall receive many times as much, and shall inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and last will be first. It's an often quoted scripture passage, usually out of context. But here he's talking about those of us that follow Christ currently, or last, the world hates us. We're seen as the bottom dwellers, you know. But that's going to change in eternity where we're going to be exalted during uh, the millennium and on into all eternity if you're a follower of Christ. So we now see here in Luke 22, 29 through 30, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that <clears throat> you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel, talking to the disciples again there. And we now see in Luke 22, 29 through 30, a mother looking, after her, looking out for her sons. And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him and said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command in, that in your kingdom... Uh, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left. Mom's going to get it done here. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup which I'm about to drink? They said to him, We are able. And he said to them, My cup you shall drink. 
But to sit at my right hand and my left, this is not mine to give, but it is those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And so once again, a future kingdom is viewed here in this passage. And Mark 14, 25 says, Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he's been on a diet. I uh, hope that's encouraging to some of you women. But uh, nevertheless, it's been a 2,000-year diet almost. And so we now see that there are multiple resurrections in Scripture. And that's significant if you take Scripture literally. So amillennialism, but not Scripture, teaches one general resurrection of the dead and one general judgment. Uh, Revelation 25, this is the first resurrection. However, on this complicated chart that's impossible for everybody to read here, uh, there are different resurrections. You have the resurrection of Christ. You have the resurrection of believers at the rapture. You have the resurrection... See, the rapture, only those who are members of the body of Christ, which started on the day of Pentecost and ends with the rapture. And then seven years later, after the tribulation, all people who are believers, starting with Adam and Eve forward, are going to be resurrected in conjunction with the second coming. Also, the saints in the book of Revelation who are martyred or killed during the tribulation will also be resurrected at that point. And then we go to the millennium, and it doesn't say in Scripture that there'll be a resurrection at the end of the millennium or earth history, but we assume there will be because you can't go into eternity in a mortal body. So there'll be a resurrection there. So that's what we mean by there's different resurrections throughout history. Revelation 20 teaches premillennialism. It's valid because of the great consuming promise of Revelation 20. Six times it talks about a thousand years. In fact, the first three uses of this in Revelation 22 through 7 simply states that the kingdom will be a thousand years. And then the last three explain the first three. So you don't use a, a figure of speech that's not literal, in, in, especially in the last three that is explaining uh, what he's talked about in the first three uses of a thousand. So a thousand means a thousand. And we see in Revelation 19, 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True. This is Christ, of course, uh, coming back at the second coming. And in righteousness he judges and wages war, not according to a Gallup poll, not according to the, how the average person does, but in righteousness. God's righteousness, he judges and wages war. People say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, so what? You're going to be judged. There is such a thing as absolute reality. In spite of the philosophies that people develop today to make it seem like their truth is a reality for them, but not for other people. You see, well, that, sorry, that's not the way the real world works. And we see in verse 12, it says, and his eyes are a flame of fire. So this shows his intent. His intent is judgment. And upon his head are many diadems. And this shows his right to rule. The crowns of the ancient world, he has the right to do this. And he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. And so this is the self-revealing God. That's the only way we can know about God is through revelation is him revealing himself to us. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Now, I think, and you know, not everybody agrees with me on this, but I think he's in the sequence of the different events related to the second coming. He first goes to Petra and rescues the Jews there. Then he comes at the second coming described here in 1913. And so he's already done battle, so to speak, there. It's dipped in blood, but if nothing else, it shows his intent is judgment. And his name is called the Word of God. You know, he just speaks a word, and it happens. See, uh, some people, as they're, as they're dying, the, uh, they still have enough strength to say a word or two. You see what I'm saying? That's something 
for a human that requires the least amount of effort. He just, and God, with all these billions of people and all this stuff that's happened in history, he just speaks a word and he blows away the bad guys. He doesn't even have to extend his right arm, so to speak, his, or exert his power in any significant way beyond that. And so we see in verse 14, it says, And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. That's us. How many of y'all have ridden a horse before? Okay, for those that haven't, this will be your chance, as you're, if you're a believer. We'll return with him. Of course, he'll do all the work. <clears throat> we'll get to have a ride there then, and we'll be coming back with him as the bride of Christ. Verse 15 says, And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, uh, so that with it he may smite the nations. And once again, I think that that's simply an idiomatic way of saying he's going to speak a word of judgment here. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he's going to be a dictator. No voting during the millennium. That'll cut out, cut out a lot of bureaucracy and things. But I'm, you know, if you have a righteous dictator, that's the best form of government. But we don't have that right now. Needless to say, we may have a dictator, but <laughs> certainly not righteous. But Christ is going to be that one. And ruling with a rod of iron means uh, if you step out of line, he's going to correct you. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. I don't know about you, you older people. Remember that uh, Lucy in the trampling out the grapes in that particular show? Well, some of y'all are looking like you don't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, and how she ended up getting in a fight and all of this kind of stuff when they were uh, squashing grapes <clears throat> on a particular program. Well, it's going to be much more uh, amazing than that. It's God's wine press, and the fierce wrath of God the Almighty is going to be the result. And on his robe and on his thigh is a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here's a, a little song by a hippie from the early 70s uh, from Calvary Chapel. Whoops, it's not playing. You have the sound turned down? Back and to... I beheld a shine. Then the heavens rolled back like a scroll. And I beheld a shining white heart. And the one who sat on him was the faithful and true. And in right. certainly be a hallelujah moment. And we see uh, premillennialism is valid because of the great consuming promise, consummating promise of Revelation 20. No longer, and, and this reflects that in Isaiah 65, 20, and I'll tell you here in a minute, it says, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, 
and the one who does not reach the age of 100 should be thought a curse. So if you have a youth dying at age 100, even though that was not revealed in Scripture, it's going to be a thousand-year period. This anticipates it, even in the Old Testament. In fact, I've read that some Jewish people, up to two to three hundred years before Christ's coming, speculated that the millennium would be a thousand years. Some speculated other time, but you had that speculation even hundreds of years before Christ came within Judaism. And so we also see in Isaiah 24 uh, where this seems to follow the sequence of Revelation 19. It says, so it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on the earth, just like Revelation 19 and 20 talks about. And, And they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. So after many days, I think, is a reference to the millennial kingdom, even in the Old Testament. So the early church was premillennial. Um, so you have Adolf Harnock, a German liberal, but an accurate historian, says early Christians were called Kiliast. And uh, he says that it was inseparably associated with the gospel itself. And he further says, faith in the nearness of Christ's second advent and the establishment of his reign of glory on the earth was undoubtedly a strong point of the primitive Christian church. Philip Schaff, the noted historian, uh, wrote of the period prior to the first council of Nicaea in AD 325. See, they didn't have church councils uh, up until 325, because before that, uh, Christianity was illegal. And in 313, Constantine Christianized the Roman Empire. And that's why the first council of bishops, in other words, from all over the known world, came together at the Council of Nicaea, which is one of the places where they started articulating the, the Trinity, for example. And so this is the first of a dozen church councils where the bishops from these churches, I think there are over 800 at the Council of Nicaea, uh, declared what, the, what was orthodox because they're fighting heresy here. And so uh, Schaff says, the most striking point in the eschatology of the anti-Nicene age, that's before 325, is the prominent kiliasm or millennialism. Uh, Kilios is the Greek word for a thousand. Mille is the Latin word for a thousand. That is the belief of a visible reign of Christ in glory on earth with the risen saints for a thousand years before the general resurrection. So he said everybody believed that just about. And in fact, Justin Martyr said in AD 140, now Justin Martyr was a disciple of Polycarp, Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. So uh, Polycarp would have really known what uh, the Apostle John was talking about. He says, but I and whatsoever Christians are orthodox in all things do know that there will be a resurrection of the flesh and a thousand years in the city of Jerusalem, built, adorned, and, uh, and enlarged according to Ezekiel, Isaiah, and other prophets have promised. So we see Tertullian in 210. Tertullian is the theologian that gave us the word Trinity. And he said, but we do confess that a kingdom is promised to us upon the earth, although before heaven, only in another state of existence, inasmuch as it will be after the resurrection for a thousand years in the divinely built city of Jerusalem. And so we see the removal of the persecution of Christians by the Emperor Constantine, accompanied by a union of church and state, and a general rejection of the doctrine of the coming king. So what you had, they estimate about 8% of the Roman Empire was Christian in 313, and within 25 years you had 98% of the Roman Empire becoming Christian. Now how many of you believe those were genuine Christians? Well, some were but many were not. It just became the state religion. 
And so the rise of the Alexandrian school of interpretation in Alexandria, Egypt, in about 350 BC, the philosophers from Athens all moved to Alexandria. That became the center of Greek philosophy. And so they didn't like taking the Bible literally. Uh, the allegorizing method rather than the literal is what they favored. So this approach, they had four levels of interpretation and uh, literal was the least desirable and they got down to allegorization as the fourth level that they favored. This approach included a strong rejection of Kiliasm or premillennialism by Origen, who was a theologian of this school. The large influence of Jerome, and he, he wrote in the 300s, away with a thousand years. And Augustine, Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, who became the first substantial Catholic theologian to espouse amillennialism. So, uh, he rejected Kiliasm on superficial grounds. Freely spiritualized scripture taught that Satan is bound in the present age. And one amillennial commentator of about 75 years ago said, Satan has a long chain. <laughs> he sure does. <clears throat> and theorized that Christ might return in the year 650. They had a different calendar. than uh, It was more expanded than what we have. And while this date was later adjusted to the year A.D. 1000, by the way, seven countries in the year 999 converted to Christianity. They thought Christ was going to return, including Russia. And beyond before it is finally abandoned. Augustinian amillennialism dominated the Roman church in his day and for centuries to come. And it dominates overall Christianity today. So you have then the failure of amillennialism and postmillennialism. Uh, and then premillennialism harmonizes the entire Bible. So when you look at the development of millennialism, you see ancient premillennialism called Kiliasm up to about 350. You have, before that, you don't have amillennialism, but you have anti-millennialism, people who are just opposed to premillennialism. That was later formulated by a guy named Tychonius and Augustine around the year 400 into amillennialism. Say ah again. Very good, okay, meaning no. And then postmillennialism, and then you had postmillennialism become a big issue in 1703, by the way, do you know what the founding father, the Puritans that first came to this country were? They were premillennial. In fact, one of the Mathers, you know, you have three generations of Mathers, uh, and next was Increase Mather, who was the second president of Harvard. Did I say that right? And then you have Cotton Mather. Uh, Increase Mather only had published 125 books, but his son had over 425 books published, uh, mainly in Latin. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, it was the Puritans who were premillennial until about 1720 with Jonathan Edwards, who was a postmillennialist. And so many of the Americans became postmillennial, and for some reason, Postmillennialism began to decline because of the Civil War. Can you imagine that? I guess the kingdom wasn't coming in. You see what I'm saying? And premillennialism, the kind we hold to, uh, was uh, initiated by Darby in England around 1820s. And after the Civil War in the 1870s, you have premillennialism that we hold to. Dispensational uh, began to dominate evangelicalism as it still does today. Evangelical means those who believe the Bible. And so that's kind of a development of, of that. And we see in Revelation 20 verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. 
and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So the false prophet and the Antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire. And I like to use the illustration um, that when a person dies as an unbeliever, they go to the county jail and they're waiting their trial date. Their trial date's going to happen at the end of history, at the end of the millennium. And so we know from Luke 16 that uh, the county jail is very similar <laughs> to the uh, lake of fire or the penitentiary where you go and serve um, your, your scene. Now, I grew up in Austin, Texas, and my mother would say, if you don't straighten up, you're going to end up in Huntsville. That's where the state penitentiary is located. <laughs> but nevertheless, they're going to end up in the lake of fire, but they're being held in uh, the abyss until that time. And so Satan's cast in the abyss here because he has another role in history at the end of the millennium. And that is those who become believe, uh, uh, the, the millennium starts with 100% believers and some of their children uh, do not become believers. But it's just the opposite of today. We have secret service Christians today that won't, are afraid to admit that they're believers. Well, it's going to be just the reverse. These are going to, because Christ reigning on his throne, they're going to be uh, intimidated and not uh, standing against him. But when Satan's released, he apparently has some ability to embolden people, and that is what God uses to draw out those who are born during the millennium that don't know Christ as their Savior, and they're going to surround the New Jerusalem. And he, instead of taking seven years to get rid of them, he's just going to speak a word and destroy those people. So that's a short time. And then after that, you have the, the millennial temple, which is one mile square, which won't fit on the temple mount there in Jerusalem. But so you see, the millennium begins. Christ is on the Davidic throne. You have the removal of the curse except for death. The millennial temple, temple sacrifices. And those sacrifices that are described in Ezekiel 43 and 44 are not sacrifices that depict the death of Christ. They're simply sacrifices for the cleansing of the temple and for the priesthood. Now, Satan has his last revolt. You go to the great white throne judgment, and that's the end of history. So history moves from a garden to a city with a cross in between. And so in, in, in Genesis, you see Satan's rise and Satan's demise in Revelation 20. You see Satan's judgment pronounced in Genesis, but in Revelation, Satan's judgment is performed in Genesis, you see the presence of God is removed because of the fall. And in Revelation, the presence of God is restored. And this is taught, Revelation 21 is the eternal state here. And in Genesis, you see the curse is received. But in Revelation, the curse is removed. And in Genesis, death enters natural creation. But death is excluded from the new creation, the eternal state. Pain and sorrow is experienced as a result of the fall in Genesis. But in Revelation, pain and sorrow is excluded in the eternal state. You have the entrance to the tree of life is barred in Genesis. But entrance to the tree of life is blessed in Genesis 22, the eternal state. You have the cycle of night and day in Genesis. But there's no night, there's no sun, no moon, only light, which I believe is the glory of God that lightens the place. In Genesis, you have the first heaven and first earth. And in Revelation, you have the final heaven and earth. God clothes fallen man in Genesis, but God clothes redeemed man in the book of Revelation. God's face is hidden from them. Remember how Moses wanted to see the face of God? So God had him, hid him behind a rock 
and he saw the backside or the shadow of his backside as he walked by. And his face glowed from that for many days. So we're going to get to, in the, we're going to get to look into the Father's face. That means we're going to get to know him intimately. And so with that, are you ready for the rapture? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the tremendous plan that you have in spite of human opposition to it. And I pray that this will embolden us to stand for you knowing the future. That certainly is going to come to pass. And I pray that if there's anybody here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that your Holy Spirit would move on their hearts, opening them up to the Word of God and receiving you as a gift from yourself. And we pray that as we go out today that we will embolden to preach the gospel and live for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Ice. Maybe some of you are wondering, why does this matter? Um, you know, why don't we just worry about living my life and let God worry about the future? But one, it's a lot of scripture is given to talk about this, not just on accident. It's done purposely. But just as an illustration of why it matters, you realize that in our own city, there are some de definitely some different views on from very prominent groups of people on this topic of millennialism and the reign of Christ. Uh, certainly the most influential is a belief in what is called kingdom now or dominion theology. And that impacts how they live and how they act and what they do and why they do it, even to the point of uh, wanting to infiltrate every area of life in order that they might make things good enough for Christ to return. On the other hand, we're not worried about that. We're worried about living for Christ in a world that is destined to continue to spiral downward with the reality that we're not going to fix it, but Christ is. That gives us a whole much greater hope, isn't it, when it's dependent upon Him than when it's dependent upon me? Now, there's so much more we could say, but I just wanted to remind you that this does matter. It matters immensely on how we approach life and approach uh, the world around us and our trust and dependence on the Word of God. So don't kid yourself to think, well, that doesn't matter. It does matter, and it matters immensely. I trust that if nothing else, this will cause you to go back to the Word of God and say, what does God's Word say? Um, there's so many different beliefs and philosophies that are out there even amongst quote-unquote Christianity or evangelicalism, even popularity of different views and uh, even, uh, even amongst institutions that once held strong to a dispensational theology have wavered and have gone to seek after, after immediate ways or other ways, and it's, it's sad to see. And really, it becomes down to who are we going to depend upon? Are we going to depend upon God and His Word and in His righteousness and in His justice, or somehow are we going to relate that to us and to our own? I, for one, would rather stand upon His righteousness and His justice than my own. It's a much safer place to stand. Let's pray as we dismiss this morning. Lord, we do thank you for these things. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, the fact that we can rest in you. That Lord, uh, despite all the chaos around us, you are absolutely in control. And Lord, you will set things right. Lord, we look forward to the day of your coming when we will meet you in the air, but we also look forward to the time when we will see you glorified and see the Son glorified when he comes to rule and reign over this world. Lord, well, he will establish righteousness, not us. Lord, we pray and tell then that we would be your faithful servants, that we would seek to be your ambassadors, as Paul says, constrained because of your love for us. Lord, you come, and we wait eagerly for it, even as we trust and rest in your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed.